The music box is, for me, the funniest half hour I've ever seen. Getting the piano up that hill. I, as a kid, I used to watch it, and I still watch it today, and it's still funny. Would you gentlemen please let me care? Oh, just the number of ways they found to get this piano back down and then get it back up again. It was just side-splitting. It was wonderful. And what makes it even funnier is the punchline. All you had to do was to drive around that road to the top here. That there's a road that could take them round the back. Why didn't we think of that before? Proper straight man and comedian in a way. The seed was so thin and Eddie Large. <laughs> it's called Eddie Large for a reason. <laughs> Although, technically, Sid was the taller man, Eddie just weighed more, but narrow and wide didn't quite have the same ring. Women have only got to take one look at him, and you know the first thing they say? Can I take them off now? Exactly. <laughs> Sid and Eddie spent 13 years at the top of the light entertainment tree, regularly pulling in up to 15 million viewers. It was like watching a, a, a typical, very typical variety act. Sid Little knew how to let Eddie Large be funny. He knew when he had to say something, when he had to say nothing. As long as Sid was there, Eddie was one very, very funny comic. I would like to sing my song now. As a matter of fact, it's not very nice threatening the audience like that. Five pound head to get in here, you know. Five pounds? That's all the BBC could afford. <laughs> I was working with them, and it got to lunchtime. And Eddie had to do one line as a voiceover. And the director said, no, 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 uh, uh, Sid, we don't need you. You can go to lunch. And Eddie turned around, looked at him and says, no, Sid, I need you standing there. And I watched that and I thought, God, that tells you so much about their relationship. Perhaps what we all love best, though, is Muttley's trademark angry muttering. Legendary voice artist Don Messick beautifully imbues the mongrel with a frustrated, almost impotent fury whenever he's chastised by the dastardly dick. And this may be your last birthday, you dumbhead. Better fresh and rush and fresh and rush and rush. He's saying something incredibly rude, but you can't exactly tell what it is. It was a shit-faced kind of bastard. Now, if I translate that, you'd have to be taken off the air. You're a rut <laughs> face. You're a red ass shit face, can it bastard? I've got one coming up in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> God moved in a mysterious way. Their 30 year union featured stage shows, radio programs, and a sitcom that began in 1983 and gave viewers a peek into their home life in Stacton Trestle. They were incredibly rude. I beg your pardon, what are you insinuating? But they did it in such a clever way that we'd never quite seen that before. I think it's high time you started charging for your singing lessons. Oh, I couldn't. Why not? Oh, with Andy, how could I possibly take money from somebody like the butcher? <laughs> I mean, we've been going to the Tolmans now 25 years. That man has not put his meat up once in a quarter of a century. Northern Housewives, Mrs. Sissy Braithwaite and Mrs. Ada Shufflebottom, comedy creations of Roy Barraclough and Les Dawson, hitched their boobs and flashed their bloomers in a series of sketches in the 1970s and 80s. I don't know where that came from, but I know where it's going. <laughs> Your trouble is you're, you're just crass, Ada. Absolutely crass. Women's ailments were a very, very big part of the sketches. I'm approaching the change. <laughs> approaching the change? From which direction? Most of the comedy I remember coming was not always from the sketches, but just from the looks they gave each other, which basically tells the audience this has got a double meaning that you probably haven't even thought about before, but I've just made that slightly smutty. I wonder who sculpted it. <laughs> Whoever he was, he weren't sure to clear, was he? A recent stage play revived classic sketches and examined the friendship between Les and Roy. Not only did the audience get to enjoy these um, wonderful sketches, but they got to see a bit of the, the wonderful bond that Les and Roy had. Who's been tampering with my question cards? It was me! It was me! All the anarchy that you saw was always very well prepared 
Um, it, it, it was the sort of anarchy that takes six months to get right. Steve Nallen was Margaret Thatcher to Rick Mail's Alan Bastard. There was a lovely moment where um, he wanted me to take my teeth out as Thatcher and, and I said, I think I can make my mouth look as if it hasn't got any teeth in because I could do my grandmother. And I said, Mrs Thatcher, we end up talking like that. And he just loved that. And he said, can we put more of that in? I was just trying to be true to the spirit of Thatcherism. All you care about is number one. I thought that's what Thatcherism was all about. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is, of course. He had great eyes for a comedian. So when he was doing Kevin Turvey, which he sort of sat on a chair and stared straight into camera, he was a sort of like a Ronnie Corbett on acid. And, and he's, he, you could see into his head. It was like you could almost see the sort of electrical thunderstorm that was going off in his head. Uh, and that would come straight down the camera. And very, very few comedians have ever been able to do that trick. And that's why he was so brilliant on Jack and Ori. I'm going shopping in the village, George's mother said to George on Saturday morning. So be a good boy and don't get up to mischief. 